Richard Skipper celebrates. Every show is a celebration. Each show, Richard delivers the artists you love, showcasing what makes them unique. Never gossipy. The antidote to a sometimes hectic world. Now, here's your host, Richard Skipper. Happy Sunday, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of Richard Skipper Celebrates. I am so excited about today's show. Those of you who have seen the show before, and those of you who are coming back, you know that my show is all about celebrating artists and their body of worth. What makes a great artist? How do they get from point A to point B and beyond? Well, today I'm very excited because we have Sparky Marcus in the wings. Now, Sparky Marcus, you may not remember the name some people, but he was very popular in the 70s. He did every single show on television. He worked with every great actor and actress in show business. And I kept seeing him. I still see him all the time, thanks to wonderful reruns. But before I bring Sparky on, let's take a look at his past. And then you and I will get a chance to sit down and meet the real Sparky Marcus. Hello, world. Oh, hi. hi. Y'all be saying hello to Sigmund. Hi. Hi, fatso. Oh, you see what I mean? <laughs> I know. Why doesn't everybody stay for dinner? I'll get some steaks. We'll barbecue. I don't think we can tonight. Well, why not tonight? We're not doing anything. Johnny, I want you to look straight up, okay? Straight up. Nope. Straight up. There we go. Hey, aren't you a little young to be fooling around with guns? I don't know. Who are you, dumb? What do you mean? Nobody sees look at a doll. This is a girl. And girls don't play with brains. Shoving us. Well, your soul is already on the road to hell. That man, or woman, as the case may be, is whispering in your ear that it's hip, that it's groovy, to go against the Lord. But you know in your heart, there's no one groovier than God. See there, you got the spirit built right into you. I think that it is so wonderful that you can talk to God. This is violence! This is outrage! This is the work of Satan, the power of darkness, the devil incarnate! Jen? Ah, that's the wrong bet. Why is it called Daddy Mayo showing his pig just now? Because that's what he is. Oh. Well, we can't let anyone else know, but we have Santa Claus in our stable. <laughs> Peter, where is your mother? She's coming. She's putting all that goop on her face. Hey, Nicholas! What are you guys talking about? Well, uh, Billy, one... When... <laughs> when a man loves a woman. Oh, you're talking about sex. Do you think she knows we miss her? Do you think she's having a good time where she is? Yes. I think she knows. What's my aunt's favorite program? I told you not to talk so loud. I'm sorry. Was my aunt's favorite program? Was? You mean they're dead? No, but they're in the hospital. That's why I'm here. Mom, don't cry. How do you know my name when I don't know yours? George. You call me George. Grandma says because I've been bad, Santa's gonna pass us by. With all those presents for you children under that tree already, what possible difference could it make? Because we've asked him for all the expensive stuff. Grandma, Santa is real, isn't he? Of course he is, Clarky. And he has a helper who carries a big stick to hit bad little children with. Is that true, Mommy? Well, darling, the way I heard it, the stick is for grown-ups who frighten little children. On the way down, we stopped at every historical monument we could. And tell me, Ian, which was your favorite? McDonald's. <laughs> Master, please. Please, let me buy him from you. You'd give up your wages for a year? For a whole year just for a lamb? For him. Yes, sir. Hey, guys. Congratulations. We had a ball, huh? Coach Elsie, man, we don't want you to go. Nah, I have to. 
No, you don't. What? Yeah, our regular coach now. We voted him out. <laughs> you mean you voted little Earl's dad out? That's right. We don't want him anymore. Oh, wow. Hello, Father. <laughs> Arthur, are you okay? I'm fine. Hi. <laughs> Hello. If we don't procure new uniforms, the team's in big trouble, right? Well, yeah, but then technically speaking, we, the Weaver Bears, are an endangered species. That's honest. Yeah. 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 Bring in Billy. Yeah. Not Billy. <laughs> yes, I took a few precautions. Tough break, kid. But then again, nobody ever said that show business was fair. You better be careful with this glove. This has got Hank Aaron's autograph on it. I got it right before the 57 World Series. What is this? Show and tell? Just give me the glove. <laughs> this kid's cruising for a bruise. Yeah, but he's good. Marcus, as I look at all this, I, I see my childhood passing right before my very eyes. I can only wow. imagine what yours... Uh, you know, what the feelings are like for you to watching this. I do want to say, before we uh, jump into this, I want to thank our mutual friend, Chuck Pennington, for putting that uh, incredible montage together, and also for bringing you and I together. How are you today? Very good, very good. Chuck is a very a very kind person. I've been happy to know him. No, he's, he's just the best. Uh, before we start looking back, uh, I do want to talk about where we are right now. Uh, we are still, unfortunately, in the midst of a pandemic. And I just want to know how you are doing, really, in the midst of this crazy time that we find ourselves in. Um, I, I live in a small community in Northern California, and uh, we're looking forward to our county coming out of the purple tier to the red tier tomorrow, I've heard. So we've been doing good at keeping our numbers down. And, and um, you know, uh, we all love our neighbors and we're doing the best we can. That's great. And what, what are you doing now with your life? Are you, I mean, you, I know that you're no longer in the business. Uh, and uh, uh, what do you do with your time now? Um, I, got a, I got my physical therapy license in 1991. And I've been working in hospitals ever since 1987. So I've been really lucky. I found where I belonged at a very early age, where a lot of people, my peers at the time, held down a lot of different jobs to try to figure out where they belonged. I lucked out. You know, one of my first jobs as a kid, I, like, it stuck. So I've been in my, where I live in Northern California for 25, going on 26 years, and I've worked at the local hospital. And, uh, you know, I want to go back. Uh, I know that you were born in Hollywood. Uh, mm -hmm. a great, uh, Hard to believe, right? <laughs> a great place to be born. Uh, yeah. But uh, if you can tell us a little bit about your life, I always like to go back to the five-year-old self uh, because that's when life starts to uh, really begin. But it really began for you uh, because you uh, found yourself in the world of Sid and Marty Croft with Sigmund yeah. and the Sea Monsters. Yeah, I was seven years old when I got that show. And the odd thing with that was they were looking for a teenager. And somehow I got to read and I got hired. I used to crack Rip Taylor up, told jokes. <laughs> <laughs> they thought they were funny. Um, when I started working, I was just after my fifth birthday. And my mother had a friend whose child was in the business, Claudia Lamb, very nice girl, was still friends. Um, and she convinced my mother to let me read for an agent and I got a job. So it, it, everything just kind of clicked. You know, it is life is about timing. And it was definitely back then. Well, you were constantly working through that period. And do you, uh, uh, were, uh, were you and your family uh, very ambitious in terms of looking for the work that came your way? Or did these opportunities come because obviously the talent was there? Uh, people are seeing what you're doing. Uh, and in some instances, it's the people you know, it's being at the right place at the right time. It is. Uh, what was the story for you and your family? I had what I consider the best child's agent in Hollywood, Mary Grady. Great lady. Uh, we worked together for a long time. I think I was active for 13 years, and I think she was my agent for like 11 of them. Wow. Um, and you know, we went on, I would have to run home from school, literally. I mean, I didn't live far away, so it was easy, but, and hit the interview circuit. And they call them auditions now. Back in the day, we called them mm -hmm. interviews. Okay. And my mom knew every back street between where we lived in Pasadena and North Hollywood, Burbank, Hollywood, oh, to get out to the valley. Uh, 
I mean, we, we, <laughs> she was a maniac behind the wheel and we would hit maybe five interviews a day after school between say four o'clock and maybe six thirty, seven o'clock at night. And was there any sense of, for lack of a better word, normalcy in your childhood uh, with this kind of a world going on? And were you aware of the impact that you were making as an actor at this point? No, no. In fact, I would go as far as say, I thought everybody did that same thing. You know, I figured, you know, when they run out, when they're done with school, they got to run home. They have to too, you know? <laughs> so, you know, it, I was at the time I was the only kid in my class. And then as I progressed in school, the only kids, my only kid in my school who was working. So it was both a blessing and a bit of a curse. Um, now, I, know, interviewed, uh, I interviewed Stan Livingston a few weeks ago and he was talking, uh, his parents decided that he would go to public school as opposed to going to private school. And mm -hmm. it was a blessing and a curse uh, because uh, there were some kids that wanted to be his friend because he was on television. And then there were other friends that bullied him uh, because yeah. of jealousy or whatever that was. Did you have mm -hmm. those experiences as well? And oh, how yeah. were you able to get through that? You know, sometimes I look back and I really don't know why. I, I don't know how. Because, um, you know, the, the community I grew up in was pretty small. And I had the same kids in my class every year for six years in elementary school. And then I saw the same kids every day through junior high, all the way through high school. So it's not like my my atmosphere changed my my circumstances didn't change it just progressed from year to year until one day it just stopped and i don't know if it was because we all got older they got tired of it or they found somebody else to pick on but you know there was that and as far as i never felt that anybody used my friendship to try and and try to get a leg up or something mm -hmm. that never happened to me uh i actually had my my core group of friends that i had in high school and elementary and even in junior high school i'm still friends with that's great i still keep in touch with them um you know i don't like i'm not the high school reunion type of guy so i've never gone back to one and i you know high school was a tough time for me so wow. i was glad to get out of it and get moving with my life and uh, thank God that you moved on and you know you did what you want to do. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I, I know I'm an actor myself, and you do a show. You're uh, with a group of people, and uh, and then the show ends, and sometimes you don't see those people again. Yeah, correct. And I know that with a few exceptions, uh, we saw uh, you know a lot of career highlights here. Um, there were very few times that you were actually working with other other kids. You were mostly working with adults in the correct. Group. Yeah, and, yeah. They, they had a designated person on set who was the child wrangler. <laughs> somebody go, child wrangler, and here's somebody come <laughs> in, take me off, you know, go over here. Um, but I, I want to ask you, how many of those people that you worked with, I mean, we saw Rip Taylor, you mentioned him earlier. He was great. Uh, Horace Leachman, uh, uh, Louise Lasser, all these people that you worked mm -hmm. with, uh, did any of them become mentors to you? Did any of them take you under their wings? <laughs> and what advice do they impart upon you? You know, really, I don't recall much of that except for John Aston when I uh, was in Freaky Friday. He actually spent time with me getting to know me as a person and not just, you know, as a as a coworker. And uh, he did give me some advice on how to stay out of everybody's hair. <laughs> I will say that. Um, he was a great guy to work with. I, I enjoyed that production. Um, when I was on the set of WKRP in Cincinnati, I can't explain to you how oh, well you get it but how to somebody who's never been in show business how tight a cast can become i mean it's like a small fraternity i don't know how else to explain it mm -hmm. and i was only on one episode i only worked on that show for one week but it stands out <laughs> and, well, and when they wrapped two or three years later it's unusual the when you have a rap party you invite the people that the memorable people i got invited to the rap party um didn't go i was young and we mm -hmm. had conflicting whatever but um it was flattering just to be invited uh that they remembered me all those years later it, it's it's flattering when those things happen now i want to ask you how the name sparky came about <laughs> the real name is Mark. okay you know, <laughs> that is like the top two interview questions i ever got when i went on interviews all right so you got to roll your head back to 1967, okay? And my dad would pass out at the sight of blood. So I was a planned C-section. Dave came and time to go to the hospital. And my dad freaked out. So my mom had to drive both of them to the hospital. We lived in East L.A. And like I was born in Hollywood at Hollywood Presbyterian. And so I imagine this thing in my head where my mom's in the wheelchair and the nurse is pushing her and they have this sign that says, mom's this way dad's this way to the smoking room because my dad was a chain smoker at the time 
And they were arguing over what to name me. At some point, it was going to be Marcus Aurelius Asolio. I, I, what my mother told me was it got to the point where she just said, at this point, I just want the kid out of me, and I really don't care what you name him, so just do whatever <laughs> you're going to do. So when the nurse handed me to my mother after I came out, she didn't say, here's a little darling, here's a little bundle of joy or whatever. She said, here's a little Sparky. Wow. So it was the 60s, baby. So that probably wasn't too odd of a name at the time. No, no. So my mother assumed that was what my father named me. So when my dad finally got to see my mom, she goes, oh, did you see Sparky? Oh, Sparky was great. Yes, it was wonderful. They both thought each other named me until, honestly, when it came time to do the birth certificate and they were like, how did we come up with that exactly? And they figured out that the nurse had done it, the, the OB nurse. <laughs> And well, it's I stuck, say, it's here I am. A great yeah. stage name, and uh, I know, I you know. mentioned your agent early on. Uh, did I mean from the very beginning? Did they say you're going to be Sparky Marcus in this business? Yep. And I wouldn't be surprised if Claudia's mom, my friend Claudia's mom, came up with that. Or I, you know, and like I said, I was four at the time when we were doing headshots and stuff, and I didn't get my first job until after my fifth birthday. And then the whole rush to join Screen Actors Guild because you can't work unless you got a card, but you can't get a card until you get a job. And you got to get your card before you can go. So I remember going down to Screen Actors Guild for all that when that happened in 1973. Uh, but it, it just stuck. And yeah, I went by Sparky until junior high school. I mean, I my mother only called me Marcus when she was angry. <laughs> so, you know, I hear Marcus, I'm like, oh boy, it's on. You know? Well, does your wife call you Sparky or Marcus most of the time? Uh, when she writes me a nice card or something, she'll call me Spark. <laughs> but no, she only calls me Marcus in public. Uh, now, I want to go back once again to uh, Sigmund and the Sea Monsters. You mentioned okay. we're actually looking for a teenager. So you mm -hmm. came in and obviously you gave them a completely different idea of what they were wanting. And mm -hmm. God for that, because you became a, a regular on the show for a while. The second uh, season, yeah. And uh, so did they immediately... Uh, go into overdrive with rewriting the scripts or were the scripts pretty much the same just you know, perspective my feeling at the time and i'm i think things have changed a bit now because things seem to be a lot more fluid and dynamic but at the time in the early 70s i think um that stuff was planned man i just think you know it, it, you're not allowed to freelance too much as an actor especially back then especially if you're young so uh, I'm pretty sure I felt like that stuff was already pre-planned and I just lucked out and Rip Taylor and I clicked. I still remember the joke I told him. And it was? What's green has bumps with wheels. And the answer? Motor pickle. But a bump. <laughs> you know, when you're five, it was hilarious. I don't know. No, of saying. course. That's yeah. great. <laughs> I know. He fell out of the chair laughing. Oh, and my mother used I, to wear jungle garden. I only had the pleasure of meeting him once. We did an event together, and he was just the nicest man. He is. He was a gentleman among men. I, I agree. My mother used to wear jungle gardenia perfume, and he mm -hmm. loved it. He walked by my mom. Oh, Eileen, I love that. So it was kind of funny. I think she overdid it just to get his attention. So what was that world of Sid and Marty Croft really like? So imagine this, okay? You got the guys in the, in the suits, right? The voices for those guys in the suits are another part of a soundstage in their own little booth watching via closed circuit television. Mm -hmm. They would practice with their hands in the little mouth, making the mouth move. Da, 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 da. So it recorded live with the voices in real time as we were filming it. So instead of going back and doing any looping or ADR or whatever it is, you know, you can record the mm -hmm. voices after the fact. They had these guys reading hot the entire time. It was to think about the engineering that went into that, it was pretty brilliant for the time. And I want to ask, how um, did your, I mean, did everything begin to unfold? How far in advance were you booked for the jobs that you were doing? Did you pretty much have your year mapped out? Uh, did it, were there lean periods between the jobs? <laughs> our perspective, yeah. it looked like you were uh, There were definitely time. lean periods. There were definitely lean periods. And one of the things every child actor struggles with, and no matter whether they admit it or not, is when you go to 50 interviews and you don't get one job and you're used to getting a job when you can and you don't get one, it tends to affect the psyche a bit. When but I say the way I recall it, it happens to adults yeah. too. <laughs> 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 I can imagine. But you know, when you're doing that whole initial search for self and all that stuff, it doesn't help. Um, I recall finding out a week or two before 
we were going to shoot uh with the exception of the like when i read for bad news bears we knew probably six weeks in advance they did that much ahead of time and i think with the fact that it was for a series i mean it was in syndication before the first season was filmed so that was already going to be off and running um but most most stuff i would know the thursday or friday of the week before kind of thing and then it was the tough part was getting my my schoolwork because i had some teachers that were really really um accepting and helpful and they would have my stuff my mom would pick it up either before school when we were on our way to work or after school whatever and i had other teachers that absolutely positively refused to participate so i would come home and have you know, four weeks worth of math homework due in seventh grade and have to do it all, you know, in two days. So that was, there were times that were challenging. And, you know, I, I wonder why you get pushback from your teachers, but I did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as the work that you were doing, um, when did it begin to feel like work? And when did it feel like play? Or did it ever feel like play? Okay, there were a couple of times it did. There were a couple of times it did. WKRP was a perfect example. I loved going to work that week it was fun and the people were nice and they were accepting you know i worked with in relatively famous actors and actresses that wanted nothing to do with children you know i'd say good morning they'd get nothing back you know it's like okay you know i, I don't know how intimidating an eight-year-old is but apparently they are um most of the time it was work and it was especially work when i was sick or i didn't feel good and i didn't want to go and my mother would pour a cup of coffee down my throat and say let's go come on get thrown a child you were great. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. God. Oh yeah. I I got my coffee Jones on a long time ago. No. And you know, you mentioned something earlier. When you go into a set, very much, you're going into a show that's already an established group of people. Mm -hmm. Um, you, you know, was were there any tricks that you had as far as breaking the ice? Or did you learn that as you went on? Or was it you know, I, I'm sure that each situation was very different. It is, and that's a good point. Um, I never had a problem talking to people. I never have. I can strike up a conversation with just about anybody on anything. And, you know, I am a genuinely friendly person. So, you know, as long as I meet somebody who's generally the same way, we don't have a, we don't have a problem. But, you know, there were times when I worked with people that just weren't interested in investing in a relationship when somebody's going to be out there in five days, actually four and a half when you think about it. Um, it especially the live shows like WKRP. Everything, man, your days are regimented. I mean, every minute of every day, all eight hours, uh, every, you know, you know exactly where you're going to be at 815, you know, on Tuesday morning in what costume, what you or whatever, and, and how it was going to go for that day. So on one hand, there wasn't a lot of downtime in order to build those relationships, but there's enough standing around waiting for lighting or waiting for this or that or makeup or whatever, where you do get to know people. And most of the shows I worked on, people were pretty accepting. Now, as I said earlier, we also saw in the montage, we saw you grow up in front of our very <laughs> eyes. And as you were uh, going, uh, as you were uh, auditioning were you, or going to the interviews, as you said, uh, were you actually um, reading for the writers? Uh, were you meeting casting people? What was the process like in the 70s? Um, I remember I read for Carl Reiner two or three times, never got hired by him. But when Carl was there, Rob was always there, and they generally had the director, not generally a writer or a producer even, but then they just had, I don't know what to call it other than the creative team that were going to be going to be working with these guys. And occasionally there would be a, a lead actor, you know, or somebody in there. And speaking about going on interviews, you don't realize I had two different sets of friends growing up. I had my school friends. And mm -hmm. I essentially had my interview friends. And these are the guys I sat for hours at a cattle call with, you know, BSing away until it was time they finally called your name. You got to know everybody, not necessarily ever worked with them, but I knew who everybody was. Everybody knew me. And, uh, you know, uh, and I want to talk about Norman Lear. Oh, okay. And Hartman, Mary Hartman. One of my dearest friends in the world was Dodie Goodman. Uh, you know, Martha Shaw. Oh, uh, yeah. did you work with her at yeah. all on the show? And yeah, you know, was on, and, yeah, I'm, and I'm quite sure because I was there for I think 13 episodes, 13 weeks, and I'm pretty sure she was there. I recall Mary Kay Place, she was very nice to me. Louise Lasser was very nice to me. That I worked with Claudia, who's that friend I told you about. She played Mary Hartman's daughter. Uh, wow. uh I can't remember what her name was. Um, so it, 
that was a, it was very comfortable. And uh, Doty Goodman, I, I know I remember her face and I know I remember seeing her there, but I was only eight and the, the memory's a little bit fuzzy. <laughs> I'll share my Louise Lazar story with you. Ah, do tell. <laughs> I, um, she was teaching years ago at, here in New York and I called her up and, uh, you know, she, hello, Richard. And there's that distinctive voice. Yeah. Um, wow. <laughs> it, it's Richard Skipper, isn't it? Um, that rhymes with flipper, flipper, flipper. Isn't it horrible what they're doing to the dolphins? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I felt like I was in an episode of Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman. Yeah, right. Yeah, I can see her being a little off the wall. <laughs> But I love her. I love her. I love her. Love her. Everybody does. Um, so as time is going on, and we're going to talk about another aspect of your career in just a moment. Uh, but as time is going on, and uh, you were growing up before our very eyes, um, was p pardon the pun? Um, uh, was the spark going up for you? The lucky part of my career. I kind of had a, there was kind of a fork in the road when I was about 14 years old. I did an episode of Trapper John MD. And the funny, the irony, I, the ironic part of that was I was 14 playing a 17 year old who had delayed puberty. So it was kind of cool finally playing somebody older than me instead of somebody younger than me all the time. But I had an accident on the set and there, there was some confusion and basically I had 19 stitches in my forehead. Wow. And after that, you know, they said, oh, we're going to recast. And I'm going, fine, recast. I'm done. Well, I ended up sticking it out. We finished the shoot, got done. We were already two thirds of the way through. Um, one hour shows generally take five to eight working days to film. Mm -hmm. um, I was able to start doing cartoon voices. And I felt far more comfortable in that group. These are guys that I worked with every day on all these different shows. It was a mismatch or a mishmash of everybody I worked with kind of coming and going. You know what I mean? It was like there were 30 principal players at Hanna-Barbera and you got 10 of them on any one show. And it kind of rotated around. So I got I got to do that from about 1980. I started doing it about 1980. But after 1983 or 84, I did it all the way through the end of 1985. And that's when I turned 18 and kind of hung it up. Well, that's the perfect segue for us to talk about your animated career. <laughs> Um, so uh, Chuck is going to bring uh, the video up and uh, we will watch this and take a look. Banjo <laughs> not behave. He seldom did what he should. I'm not having a good time. I'm going to run away from home. That's what. You're going to come out smiling. 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 I'm sorry about that, Chef. He knows he's only supposed to eat one meal a day. Dollar! Come here, you rascal! Space stars! <laughs> Father, didn't you say that when you were young? Yes, Donald. A fire crew, like a legendary phoenix! Yes, Donald. But Father... Come, Darnell. Father, the firebird comes! <laughs> You're not Uncle Todd! And you're not Uncle Todd either! You guys are not Uncle Todd! Hi, Uncle Todd! Guess who? TJ! Why didn't somebody tell me you were coming for a visit? Oh, Mommy did! She wrote you a letter! But I decided to save the postage and bought myself an ice cream cone instead! Here, you wanna find Uncle Todd? Oh, no! <laughs> This is what a city looks like, all decorated for yeah. Christmas. And everyone comes yeah. to the city to see the Christmas spirit in the air. Get along, gang, get along, gang. Zipper's got to claim the money by noon today or he'll lose it. No problem. The caboose will get us to that cash in no time. When we find the person that owns that cabin, we'll know who's behind all this. <laughs> So long, Renegade! Oh, right! Sir! 
Why don't you just blast him? Well, what do you want to do? Make him mad? What can I say? It's true. Wow. Wow. I, wow. Wow. Most of the stuff that Chuck put together, I've never seen. Never watched it. Only well, you just things. answered my next question. I was going to ask, do, I mean, are you ever watching television and all of a sudden you hear your voice coming back? Yeah, yeah. that's happened a couple of times. Um, generally not intentionally. Uh, I've never been, a, I, I pick myself apart, so I've never been a fan of watching my own stuff. One time, I the one thing I saw when it came out on broadcast television was WKRP. I did watch that one when it came out. And my parents drug me to a, a showing a Freaky Friday during the theatrical release. Mm -hmm. So I sat, I, I watched that. Um, but otherwise, no, it's just never been a thing for me. I'm a back of the row, back row, back of the room kind of guy. I kinda, uh, it's still the same. Is, is that the same way for the animation stuff that you did as well? But are you able to I, enjoy that? It's not that I don't enjoy it. It's just, I don't, I'm not, it's hard for me to watch. I don't know how else to put it. Um, you know, watching some of the, the Cabbage Patch Kids' first Christmas. Oh, man. I remember recording that. It was, I swear, in somebody's basement in Hollywood. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm like, this is kind of hokey, but okay. You know, check clear. Let's go. You know? Uh, now it's just never been my thing. Now, how did you end up? At, uh, we talked earlier about Sid and Marty Croft, another aspect of the business, uh, Hannah mm -hmm. Barbera. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, that fan base is huge, huge, huge. Uh, how did you end up? Yeah. At, uh, how did you end up with them? I interviewed for Richie Rich, and I was actually given a secondary character, and another guy was Richie Rich for the first four episodes. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, I wound up with the job. Don't know why. Still don't know why. Um, and then that just led to other things. I the best part about Hanna Barbera is I didn't have to interview anymore. My, I would just get a call from the agent going, oh, yeah, there's another cartoon starting on Tuesday, so I'll be there. And they were actually kind enough to work around my school schedule. So I got out of school at 3, and I'd hop in my car and fly to Burbank, um, which I can make in about 20 minutes by 3.30. Mm -hmm. And so then I'd record until 6, and then I'd park cars from 6.30 till midnight at the Troubadour in Hollywood, and then went to school the next day. Now, going back to the uh, acting career for a moment, uh, I understand that when you worked on the Bob Newhart show, there was an episode with a shaggy friend. Shaggy friend? Uh, oh, oh, yes. sorry. Click a minute. Click, click, click. Sorry. It's okay. I'm a little slow these days, all right? That's Hold okay. That's right. okay. Okay. So my whole thing, when I when I worked, and generally when I was the only kid, which was 90% of the time, I hung out with the cast, or I'm sorry, the crew. I like the crew guys. I hung out with the sound guys, cameramen, you know, we'd have any downtime. I'm kicking it with those guys talking. And in walks this guy with a big old beard and a bouffant and the whole thing. And he starts talking to the crew guys like he knew them. Like, so they had some kind of relationship. I didn't know who this guy was. And so he goes, hey, kid, how old are you? And I go, I'm 11 or something. There's nine. And he goes, I got something for you. Stay right here. Five minutes later, he comes back with a rolled up poster and a T-shirt. And it says, it says Star Wars on it. I'm like, what's that? And he goes, it's this movie that's coming out next summer. You're going to love it, kid. And I went, oh, okay. That was George Lucas. He gave me a T-shirt and a poster. I still have the T-shirt. My kid wore it. My son wore it when he was old enough to fit into it. Um, it's threadbare, and the design is still there. But I've never seen another one like it. Now, so, uh, yeah, that's an amazing story. Now, now, I, uh, when you finished performing, when you finished acting, uh, did you remain in Hollywood or did you leave there right afterwards? Um, I turned 18 in December of 1985 and I left Los Angeles the day after I graduated from high school in 1986. So, no, I never went back. Let me tell you, and I'm sure you've heard it from others. And, you know, when you're not the flavor of the week, you tend to not hear from anybody anymore. So, you know, the phone stops ringing, the party invitations stop coming, you know, you know, you're, you're out. So that was me. I don't know who you exactly who you've spoken to, but over the years, making that transition from a child actor to an adult actor is damn near impossible. There aren't many that can do it. When you take the thousands of child actors in any given year, you got a dozen that make the transition post puberty into the adult world. It doesn't happen very often. And when it does, you know, yeah, you, but the reality is I always knew this was going to be a temporary ride. Um, my parents were very, you know, they wanted me to stay in acting and wanted me to continue. 
I never had that burn that mm-hmm. actors have. For me, it was a job and the family needed the money. So I went to work. Well, I, I'm glad that you're saying this because so many people have this idea of what the business is like. And uh, they think that it's glamorous, it's going to premieres, it's doing all those things. And you're absolutely right. The stretches between the gigs uh, are sometimes long. You mentioned earlier with Trapper John MD that Mm -hmm. you were finally able to do a character that even though, I mean, just to play older, did Mm -hmm. you have a hard time uh, trying to grow up uh, in the business when people don't want you to grow up? Let, let me put it this way. That was an issue in my house uh, with, my, with my parents. Um, you know, I turned 14, 15 years old. I did the whole beginner mustache thing that guys get, you know, and it looks like mouse hair, you know, before it's really whiskers yet. And I grew it out. My mom kept saying, you got to shave that. We can't go on interviews. And you're looking like that. I'm like, oh, no way. Man. I'm a man. Check me out. Yeah, it was problematic that my parents wanted to keep me young, you know, and keep me working because I'm sure they saw that it was going to be a temporary ride, too. You know, and if you can still play young, you can still get the jobs. I mean, you watch these movies where Ralph Macchio was 25 years old when he played a teenager in Karate Kid, you know, so he still had that ability, that very young face to do it. And, you know, that's what they wanted for me, too. But I I didn't. Well, thank God you were able to survive some of the <laughs> that happens. Well, my mother was very protective. Um, you know, I mean, she had this thing where she would stay off set unless she said she heard my name called more than once. And then if you can hear this, she'd do that. And I knew she was there. So I'm like, oh, God, mom's watching. Better straighten up, you know, especially when you're working with a lot of other kids, like in Bad News Bears. Mm-hmm. You get a little unruly times, you know. Um, she <laughs> she made sure that I got there on time, that I knew my lines. I was ready to work and I, there was, it really wasn't playtime. It was work time. And I only hung out with a very rare other child actor after work, you know, like on a weekend and come over to my house, I went over to your house. That only happened a couple of times. And with other places that I worked where there were more than one kid, I mean, the kids all bond together. And the next thing you know, they're all one hive mind going out, you know, doing stuff. This was the seventies in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. So the coolest place was a place on La Cienega called Flippers. And it was a, a uh, roller skating rink. So they would all go hang out. I had to go home. Mm-hmm. But obviously, I think I see the, the wisdom in her process because it kept me out of all of that stuff. Well, all of us in this business, you know, we have a period in our lives where we were doing a certain amount of work or type of work, and then that's over and we want to move on. Um, was, was it an easy transition for you to say no. that was then? No, uh, it took me two years of relatively self-destructive behavior to figure out wow. that I was okay, that I was enough for me. And yeah, I, I, mean, I didn't hurt anybody or anything. It's just, you know, I hurt myself. That was about it. Mm-hmm. But I needed to, <laughs> let's say I got kicked out of a couple of colleges before I got my act together <laughs> and figured out exactly where I want to be and how I was going to do it. Otherwise, I thought I was just kind of fulfilling the destiny I was supposed to go to college, you know, become a lawyer, do whatever I was going to do. And it didn't work out that way. But um, yeah, I did not make that transition easily. What was the click moment for you, that moment where everything changed? Um, I looked at the people I was hanging around with and said to myself, this is not where I want to be. Now, so, I understand, yeah, you know, that, uh, that your son didn't even know about this career <laughs> until he was in high school. And how did he find out about this? Well, Chuck, are you listening? (laughs) Um, Yeah, I won't say that Aiden, his name is Aiden. I won't say that Aiden was completely unknowledgeable of the situation because as as he hit certain age benchmarks, I started getting memories back because I used to, I learned how to box things up and compartmentalize Mm -hmm. because when you're upset at work, you can't work. So you got to put whatever you're upset about in a box and deal with it later because you got to be able to hit your marks, say your lines and get the next job. You know what I mean? So as he started getting older, I would start remembering things that I'd boxed up from a long time ago. And we talk about it, you know, and I would say, you know, I want you to be a young man. I want you to be a kid. I want you to join Cub Scouts or Little League or do whatever it is you want to do. I missed out on all that stuff because I was working. Mm -hmm. So as he started getting a little older, I was contacted by Chuck and had, you know, just out of nowhere, very nice guy, 
I've gotten more of a resurgence in fan mail and contacts on Facebook from people wondering who I was. Um, uh, Barbara Harris had just passed away. Yes. And he was doing a montage for her. Mm-hmm. And just, I don't know, reached out to say, hey, did you know this? I'm like, no, I didn't. So he sent me a memory stick with everything I've ever done. <laughs> and I handed it to my son. I'm like, that here's, way. here's your your legacy. You know, here it is. This is your dad in a nutshell. So go check it out. And we were on vacation. Uh, we used to go rent a house at the coast for a couple of weeks. And while we were on vacation, he watched that thing and had he didn't ask a lot of questions. He just said, Yeah, that was pretty cool. So I got the, you know, 14-year-old uh, stamp of approval. Uh, would you ever think of writing a book about your experience? <laughs> I you don't know? think I have that much to tell. No, but you I, know, I, know, I, I, I seriously, uh, I mean, I think that your story of someone who was in the business, who was a very busy working actor, and the business changes. I mean, it ha- it happens to adults. Yeah. Uh, you get pigeonholed into a, a role, mm-hmm. and then you can't get work beyond that. Um, I before I just I had this flashback. I met Mark Hamill one time, and I was eleven, so it was two years after Star Wars came out, mm-hmm. and I was at a kid whose dad was one of the crew members, and you know how he hung out with the crew members. Well, it was summertime, and his kid had come to work with him, and we became friends. Mm-hmm. So kid goes, "Hey, my little sister's going to a birthday party. Luke Skywalker's going to be there." I'm like, "Right?" He goes, "No, really." So, okay, we drive to wherever we're going to go. I'm hanging out with these guys for the weekend, and we get there. Hours go by, and we're at a little girl party, you know, and I was 11, and it was like, torture me now. You know, I've had enough. Sure enough, here comes Mark Hamill walking in. And I was like, Gah. And he walks up to me, and he goes, I know you. And I'm like, no, you don't, Mr. Wh- Mr. Hamill. I swear I'm your biggest fan. I don't know what to do. <laughs> he goes, I saw you on Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, and that was the best show I've ever seen. You rocked it. And I'm like, Luke Skywalker says I'm a good actor. <laughs> so, yeah, that was my moment. I figured if Luke Skywalker thought I was okay, it must be good. No, but he, well, he was right. He was absolutely yeah. right. I, I, I would love to say, do you even remember that? Do you remember that? Because that was like the center point of my prepubescent life, you know? Mark Hamill said I rocked. Now you ha- you mentioned your son. Do you have other children as well? No, no, no. Just the one boy. He's a freshman in college. Now, what advice would you give him if he came home one day and said, "Dad, I've decided I want to go into this business." It's funny you ask that because my mother and I had that conversation many times before she passed away. Um, she kept telling me my son was going to hate me. He was going to grow up to hate me if you don't put him into business. And I'm like, you know what? My feeling is this, and I would have told him if he was 16 and came and said that this is what he wanted to do, this was my prepared answer. I support you. Get in whatever community theater, you know, stuff you can do locally. Get into it. Get your feet wet. Um, You're a student until you turn 18 and graduate from high school. After that, if you want to move to New York and try to make it or move to Los Angeles to try to make it, I will support you as best I can, but not before then. Now, how is social media? You mentioned Chuck finding you and uh, your fans are finding you on social media and everything. How has social media really changed your life as far as people taking a real, uh, this is your life, look back at your life again? I've met some really interesting people, uh, just have, having them reach out to me. Um, I did two podcasts. You're the first person to get me on camera, so that's a big deal. Well, um, I appreciate I should... that. Thank you. <laughs> I've done two podcasts, and from those two things, uh, the only address that is findable for me, I guess, is my work address. Mm -hmm. So every couple of days, I'm getting a handful of letters here and there at work. And so now I'm having these conversations a little more, you know, Sparky Marcus, Marcus Asolio, Fairchild Medical Center, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, I have to explain that now. So I am always flattered when somebody I don't know sends me a friend request. My my standard answer is, do I know you? Because I get too much spam too. You know, I'm not going to deal with it. I'm a Nairobian prince and I want to you know give you my money. Um, I get those too. <laughs> yeah, right. I know. I wish, I so wish it were true. I uh, Make my life different. Um, mm-hmm. And basically what I get back is I was a fan of your work. I looked you up. Here you are. And my, my, what I always want to communicate is that I'm absolutely flattered when something like that happens. I'm absolutely awestruck that somebody remembers me 30 plus years after the fact and wanted to reach out and say thank you or whatever it was they want to say. I don't take that lightly. 
Mm -hmm. It's something that I am respectful of. Um, I don't take anything like that for granted. And I am thrilled to still be remembered. Absolutely. Well, I want to ask you, out of everything that you've done, um, is there any particular uh, show, movie, experience uh, that stands out above all others? Uh, that is a fond memory. If you could go back and relive that day or that time frame in your life. And it could be either in the business or outside of the business. Um, filming Freaky Friday was fun. I had a good time. Everybody was nice to me. And, you know, the story I told Chuck that he got a laugh out of was there's one scene in there where I hit the blender and chocolate mousse shoots all over me, right? Well, it took two days to film that. And after a while, liquid chocolate dries and it pulls your hair out as it does it, you know? And I remember at the end of day one, I was absolutely covered in chocolate. And my dressing room was like blocks away, essentially, in, in uh, the Disney Studios. And Barbara Harris let me use her dressing room so I could take a shower and get all cleaned up sooner rather than later. I thought that was very nice. Jodie Foster, she was class before I knew what class was. I mean, I don't know how else to put it. Well, I, ask, I mean, are, were you surprised at all at the success that she's had? No, no. She was amazing then. And uh, I, of course, I had no idea right after uh, Freaky Friday, she was doing Taxi Driver, you know, a little, little bit far apart. You yeah, know, on very, very, very. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, yeah, I'm old enough to remember the controversy. I, that, like, calls me too. Yeah. Time. Um, I enjoyed everybody I worked with on that cast, and it was great, including the the crew. Um, like I said, WKRP, fantastic, best week mm -hmm. ever. Bad News Bears, we had fun, you know, a lot of other kids, and I've got to meet some, you know, rising stars before they were anybody, you know. And um, boy, by and large, I won't say that the majority of my experiences were particularly negative. Um, some I would definitely choose not to repeat again. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, when you look at something like a job and not as an extension of who you are, where I think a lot of actors are really coming from, you yes. know, doing this show is a reflection of me and they get more emotionally invested in it maybe mm -hmm. than I did. Um, I, you know, it was, it was work, man. And I was happy to have it. Well, Marcus, I'm all about celebrating and I want to celebrate the work that you've done and, and the people that you've worked with. Um, and I never want to go into the realm of negativity in my interviews. Uh, that being said, I do want to ask you um, if there was a situation without naming names or the situation uh, so that anyone knows that was a difficult situation as far as your work was concerned and what your process was for getting through that. Hmm. There were times when, and I think I will say it was typical teenage stuff, where getting a job... Uh, interfered with my social life and that made me automatically resentful on day one and learning you know my mother used to just say you know be an adult be an adult grow up grow up you got to be an adult you know and at 10 12 you know that's hard right mm -hmm. um there were multiple times like that and i don't think i did myself any favors by taking it out on the people that i worked with um they were getting punished and they didn't know why and you know, trying to, like I said, I put stuff in a box a lot. And when I was saying that as my son hit certain benchmarks, some of that stuff started to come back. And I had to seek counseling for a little while to work some of that stuff out mm -hmm. because I had not thought about it in 40 years. And uh, some of it was not so great. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, I was trained from my earliest memories to be a grown-up and grown-ups work and you put your personal stuff aside and you just do it. And I did. And were you able to just ever, ever during that time frame in your life, shut that door and just be a kid? It never quite worked like that. Not when I was younger. I still, you know, when my son was little, we had a travel trailer. We used to leave it at this campground outside of town and mm -hmm. go every weekend, vacation stuff. And if it got dirty, I freaked out. I was never allowed to get dirty as a child. If I got dirty, I got in trouble. So I had school clothes and I had after school clothes. And if I didn't put on my after school clothes before I went and did whatever I was going to do, I got in trouble. Um, I have this thing because at any, 
every like during the summertime and stuff when i was a kid i couldn't go out because this is before cell phones couldn't go anywhere without justifying and establishing how often i was going to be in communication you know because i may get an interview and i got to drop what i'm doing and go the, the biggest rebellion I had, I think I was in seventh or eighth grade and I met this girl in class and we decided we were going to the, go to the library together after school. And I didn't tell my mom and I went straight to the library and here a couple hours later, I'm walking home and she drives by looking for me. And it was a bad scene. So I don't really think I had those opportunities to kind of let my hair down, so to speak. And well, my hope is that as an adult that you've had those opportunities Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. We've been making it for lots of lost time. <laughs> oh, that's great. I love hearing that. No, I want no, I, I you... am... no, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm married to a very patient woman. Um, we've been married 22 years, 23 years this October, and it has been a lot of fun, you know, from the very beginning. And she knew me as a, an actor, kid on television. Mm -hmm. And I remember the first time we talked about it, she was kind of surprised but she's never judged me for it she's never held it over my head it's never been an issue um and you know that the experiences i had could very easily alienate her from my parents and she took them at face value and and we've how we had we've had a good family unit that's wonderful that's wonderful i want to mention you know in our closing minutes uh some of the people that you've worked with uh throughout your career and your memories uh, of those, and mm -hmm. if there were any life lessons that you learned from them. And I'll start with someone that we just recently lost, and that's Cloris Leachman. Mm -hmm. I only worked with her the one time, right. and I really think it was only for a day or two that I was mm -hmm. on that set, and she didn't mingle with the kiddos. Mm -hmm. So, you know, no, I, I my memories of her are strictly working with her, not chatting with her. Uh, Paul Lind. Oh, he was hilarious. Um, <laughs> he was the child wrangler guy. <laughs> child wrangler? <laughs> because there were a lot of kids. There was a lot of kids on that I set. can hear him now. <laughs> I know. Oh. Yeah. Um, he was he was a hoot. I enjoyed working with him. And then when you look at the rest of the cast, and Mira. Uh, God, I'm trying to remember who else was on that thing. Uh, Alice um, Ripley. Yeah. Oh, Alice yeah. Ghostly. Yeah. They, they were a lot of fun. And we filmed that. I don't know if you've ever been to Hollywood. Um, oh, yeah. Highland yeah. and Hollywood Boulevard come together like this in a V. Mm -hmm. And that's where they have the Screen Actors Guild Theater now that they do the Oscars. Um, there's an old church right across the street from that old stone, like a Methodist church or something. Mm -hmm. Filmed it in there. Filmed and, it in a church. And I, I, I want to mention another child actor that you worked with, and that was Johnny Whitaker. Um, Nicest guy ever. We're still Facebook friends. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, nice guy. Uh, yeah, he had some tough times, but he's come through it. And, you know, I had my share of regrettable behavior. <laughs> and, uh, um, we were able to connect on multiple levels. And again, you know, I was only work, worked with him when I was seven. But, you know, he still had very uh, real memories of when we worked together. So nice guy. Not Christy McNichol. Um, she was cool too. I, you know, one of the things I don't know if other people do that, but it was what I was doing back when I was working. Um, when a show wrapped, we'd sign each other scripts, kind of like a yearbook, mm -hmm. you know, kind of thing. And she wrote a really kind thing to me when we wrapped on the pinballs, you know, because they were anytime you put more than one kid together, somebody's going to get ragged on. And it was me for being short. So she was like, you know, you may be short, but you have a big heart and you're going to be tall or something. I don't remember, but she was very kind to me. Do you still have those scripts? Somewhere. Uh, let's just say in, in over the years that boxes get lost. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I know they're under the roof somewhere. I don't exactly know where. Uh, Dabney Coleman. <laughs> oh, he was fun to work with. He was fun. But I'll tell you, and I, I told this story before, um, you know, you rehearse something, you, you record it the same way. If you screw it up in rehearsal, you're going to screw it up when uh -huh. you're doing it for real. Yeah. And this was back when film was film and not digital. And so film was money and we run out of film, you know, everybody loses. So we rehearsed the scene where he had to spank me and he bent me over his knee and I'm kind of half laughing and he'd go, you know, tap, tap, tap. <laughs> he unleashed on me when the camera filmed. And I'd only seen that clip once and it was last year and somebody wanted to put it on their social media and they're like oh, can i have your permission to put this on i'm like 
Mm. I don't know, man, because I can see the pain in my face, and it was hard for me to look at. Wow. Well, you know, it's very interesting. TCM is doing a series now on classic films that we're looking back through a different lens now. And yeah. getting a spanking at that point is, you know, there's that other layer. Yes. <laughs> we don't do that anymore. Yeah. No. no. Uh, Nancy Walker. Um, she was not a fan of the child. Mm. Uh, she was great to work with. Um, I, man, I'll tell you one thing I would, the one word I would sum her up in, she's a pro. That woman's a pro. She's been doing it a long time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some people are uncomfortable working with children, and that's just all there is to it. There's a, uh, I recommend, there's a great documentary about Alan Carr. And, you know, she directed uh, Can't Stop the Music. Oh, uh, really? You just have to watch the movie. I won't give it away here. You have to watch th uh, that documentary to catch her reaction to that film after it came out. Oh, okay, <laughs> I'll keep that in mind. Um, <laughs> B. Arthur. She was hilarious, too. I liked her a lot. I liked that whole cast. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill Macy, um, Rue McClanahan. Uh, who else Casey was on? Barbo, I interviewed a few weeks ago. Um, years later, I bumped into Rue McClanahan at the Burbank airport when I was flying back to college, and she had no idea who I was. But people were coming up to her at the airport. Oh, Miss McClanahan, mm -hmm. so nice to finally meet you. You're a great actress. I'm sure she just didn't need one more guy going, hey, we worked together a long time ago. And she just didn't recall who I was. But I, they were very nice to me when I was on that set. Now, I know that, that you worked with Rock Hudson, but that I think that scene was cut. Cutting room floor, yes. Uh, my mom was more you know, awestruck by him than I was. He was just another guy. Because I think I was in maybe third or fourth grade, maybe third, uh, when I worked with him. And I knew he was famous, but I didn't know what. I hadn't seen any of the Doris Day movies or anything that, that he was in before. Um, and he was very nice to me. It was a movie called Embryo. It's a really bizarre movie. Oh but, my god! I yeah. know the film. I know the film. Oh, you do? Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's probably a good thing that you did end up in the cutting room floor on that film. <laughs> probably. <laughs> yeah. You know, I have a few of those actually. You know, I think I I'm a, a main character on the worst movie ever actually made and released on television. So yeah, I, I've got a few of those. Now, was there one particular role that got away that you really wish that you had gotten the chance to do? <laughs> You know, I should have, would have, could it on a lot of stuff. Um, if you remember the movie Airplane, oh yeah, there were three kids. There was Rossi Harris, David Hollander, and Michelle Stacy. I read for both of those boy roles, and you know, after you get when you get called back for your fifth time, they got to pay you. So I got called back four times for that role. Either one of those roles, I didn't get any of them. Um, I read for uh, Anthony Michaels Hall's role on Vacation. Mm -hmm. Read for that one several times. No, didn't get that one. Um, the champ uh, that went to um, Ricky Schroeder, uh, the kid from Silver Spoons. Yeah, Ricky Schroeder. Yeah, with, with Rick Schroeder. Um, mm -hmm. Interviewed like that uh, on that one for a, a few times. And the thing was, you know, I was blonde when I was a kid, like him. And uh, they wanted a uh, brunette, so my mother rinsed my hair mm -hmm. with brunette stuff. They ended up hiring a blonde kid. And I want to ask so, you two more other questions. What's next for you? What's next is working a few more years and then sailing off into retirement and uh, uh, doing something fun part-time. I have a dream of pouring beer somewhere and listening <laughs> to everybody's problems. You know? Good for you. Now, Mark, know there's two places on earth that I'm comfortable. One is a hospital and one's a good pub. And if you could go back and talk to the five-year-old Sparky, what would you say to him now based, on your, based on your whole life arc? You're enough. You're enough. You're enough for you. Doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. You're enough. God bless you for that. Thank you so much. I've had, such uh, a, I hope this was fun for you. Um, I had a blast. Yeah. Well, Call it, me back anytime. Uh, well, and I might do that. I want to thank Tuck once again uh, for yeah. putting us together uh, when he suggested, I'm just th so thrilled that you said yes to this. Um, I want to thank everyone for being here today. Um, leave a comment on YouTube. Uh, that will help us uh, hit the like button. If you liked today's interview, share this with your friends. There's a share button and subscribe. Please leave a message. And if you're listening to this later on on your favorite podcast, uh, by all means, do so then. I want to let everyone know that if you're around tomorrow afternoon at five o'clock, I will be uh, sitting down with the incredible Tom Lamarck, uh, incredible arranger, musical director, conductor, 
He's worked with, uh, just like you, Marcus, he's worked with just about everybody in this business. <laughs> So I'm looking forward to that. I also end every show by telling you we want to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. Go to your Facebook friends list, reach out to the fifth name that pops up today and pick up the phone and call that person. Let them know what they mean in your life. Not with a text message, not with an email, not with an inbox message on social media. Pick up the phone and call them. As my dear friend David Friedman always says, we're all in this together, but we're not in the same boat. And you never know what someone else is going through. And Marcus, I thank you again uh, for the gifts that you've given to the world okay. and that you will continue to give. Um, You're very kind, Richard. Thank you. And I'd like you to have the final word. Anything that you want to say about anything that we talked about today that you want to expound upon? anything that we didn't talk about that you wish we had, or just any message that you want to put out to everyone. And again, thank you for being here today. I'm flattered that you were willing to have me. And I'm flattered that Chuck went through the time and effort to put those montages together. Um, it's very humbling. And I, I sincerely appreciate anybody remembering my work and, you know, liking it. Um, you know, I, I did the best I could. You know, I tried to put a good foot forward right. every time. Yeah. So I, it's been a pleasure talking with you, and I look forward to it any other time. Thank you. Stay in touch, please. Absolutely. And my love to your wife and your son. I will. Thank you, Richard. Goodbye. Bye.